All right, we are recording now. So, uh, well, first off, like I said, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about shifting left on security and why that is really important. Uh, just real quick, can anyone just briefly just tell me what does shifting left on security mean? Incorporating security into when you're writing the code at the beginning as opposed to shipping off something at the end to pass it to the security folks. Yes, exactly. So the biggest one of the biggest features of shifting left on security is just making sure that security is something that's baked into the beginning of the process rather than uh, that the kind of the security process that we see in the more traditional one that was uh, described in the Phoenix project, where you just have somebody come in on a security team and kind of just block the whole process. And they do a big elaborate review, um, but they this is almost the first time they're seeing the product or have any idea what it's even doing. Um, so shifting left on security is breaking that up, making the, the process move further into the pipeline. In my opinion, <laughs> the responsibility on this one's really complicated. So in the actual implementation of this, I think it comes down less to DevOps engineers putting this in a continuous delivery pipeline. And more so, it, the, the onus is kind of on the developers themselves to understand security vulnerabilities and be in lockstep with the security team. So if you can get a security team member all, like attached to a team of developers, uh, it'll generally be more successful. If that's not possible, security staff needs to find some way to communicate that information, to communicate those expectations further left in the process, right? Closer to the start of development, just as Nate said. Uh, there is an automation component where you can automate tests for these things that, can, that occurs and needs to occur and should occur. Um, but I think education about it is really important. So I think everyone should have some high level understanding of security, what some of the, the flaws are, and where to look up this information if you don't have it. So one of these big problems that we have is, yeah, security teams are usually super understaffed. This is like this, you know, 10 to, or one to 10 relationship of infrastructure. Like there's usually 10 infrastructure engineers for every 100 developers and one infosec person for every 100 developers. Obviously, you, it, it's really hard to find people that have the right, the deep level of all of the institutional compliance things, all of the security standards expected by an organization, uh, and expect there to have somebody on the team that is a complete expert in it. But there are tools available to help solve this. And one of the biggest ones is OWASP. Has anyone worked with, with OWASP before? Has anyone heard of this, this group? It's okay if you have it. It is very focused for developers. Yeah, I'm familiar so, with it. Yeah, yeah. Was that that was you trying to that, that makes yes, sense. it was. Yeah. No, we we heard about it and we looked at it and it seemed really promising. But we happen to have leadership that's really scared of open source projects. Period. <laughs> oh, so you know, it's like the worst rule for security, right? Because like, yeah, it's the exact opposite. Because if you have open source there, everyone breaks it, and then you get to find out where you know where you're fitting in, where things are secure. Yep. But to your point, our security staff is a person <laughs> Yeah, right. who, who is actually a sysadmin that like high five to security course once. So, yeah. And so I, you can understand, you know, that personality type that you see that kind of characterize in the Phoenix project of somebody who has to sit on top of security. They own it. If there's a security flaw, it's, you know, they're the ones who go to the meetings. They're the ones who have to make the justifications. Um, but I do, you know, the way I've seen this handled is there are these tools available from groups like the OWASP Foundation and open source. So, uh, Trent, could you explain just, I guess, you know, briefly, what, what is OWASP and why was that important in your process? So what we did was we, so there's like a, a, a group that, that you can join and there is some cost associated with some of that um, or there's an expectation of some um, donations. I don't know how that works exactly. But one of the, one of the things that, that was a possibility was they work with a group and I'm, I'm trying to remember what it's called. That's why I'm stuttering over myself, but essentially it's like an open or it's like a group of um, security testers and, and, and that sort of thing that you could almost like co-opt into being a part-time security group for you. And you could share that responsibility with other people in that chapter. They've got some tools that, that do some of that for you. Um, specifically, 
um, from a list of what, what tools you use or what uh, technologies you use. We use a pretty outdated stack, so it's not hard for them to test like Tomcat and, you know, some of the very basic tools. Um, but for our purposes, what we were looking at was the, um, the sort of shared security team that sort of works like a contractor. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. So that, that's really awesome. I didn't know that they provided that service. I think it makes sense with what they are and, that, you know, they probably provide a lot of, have a lot of different verticals. I, the interaction that I usually see with OWASP is each year they put out something similar to the state of DevOps report where they basically just list out, these are the security vulnerabilities that we we found out in the wild the most throughout the years. Um, and it's just basically they put out a document to create standard awareness for developers uh, and application security folks um, that just kind of says like, you know, broadly, these are the things you should focus on. And it's a great PDF to kind of go through and look for and create security checks. So one of the things uh, we've recently implemented across all of our different projects is a checklist just based off of these things. Like, are you, are you susceptible to these or have you, have you put in any tooling or processes in place to understanding what these things are? And at some clients, because we know they, the answer is no, we're like, do you know what this is? Are you aware of what an injection attack is? Are you, do you know what cross site stripping is? It's a great point to start the conversation. If the answer is yes and they've addressed it, then you don't need to, maybe you don't need to go hire 10 more InfoSec people, but usually there's always some point where people have egg on their face. Um, so the top 10 for the past year are injection, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure, uh, XML, entry, internal entities, broken access control, security misconfiguration, cross-site scripting, insecure deserialization, uh, using components with known vulnerabilities. That one's like so obviously what it is. The rest like kind of sounds like I'm just making up terms. But that one's like, yeah, maybe we shouldn't use that thing that we know has never been updated. Um, and insufficient logging and monitoring, which means you don't, you're not aware when things have gone wrong. I just kind of want to go through and talk about each of these a little bit. Um, I think some of them you're probably more aware of than others. Injection has been talked about a lot. I think uh, if, if anyone reads XKCD, uh, the idea here is that, <laughs> we'll get to it, I see you laughing. Uh, so basically injection flaws are really, you can inject strings of data into databases, into authentication keys uh, in ways in which the the program itself has implemented those poorly. So let's say you have an application that talks to a database and it just takes whatever you type in and just passes it in. So if it's like asks for a name, uh, it just takes whatever you type into it, injects that into, you know, it gets this parameter for ID. Here's an example here. So, and that when this is uh, given to the database, the database puts this example here and it just says like select, the star means all, so select everything from accounts where the customer ID equals, and this is where the application gets the ID. Uh, does anyone know what the problem with that is? It, it trusts ID, right? And this is just a statement that's trying to get evaluated. So in both of these cases, this is another longer case, I won't read out in, in rote, but it's here for you if you wanna look at it you can just make the statement true by saying adding an or statement and then here the examples or one equals one right and then the next web page or the next call will literally return everything you'll be able to see every account in the database as a result of that you can get way more information than you need uh this is there's a really funny example so in this uh they're saying like hi this is your son's school we're having some computer trouble and they're like, oh dear, did he say something? Did he break something? And they're like, in a way, did you really name your son? And then it's Robert and there's a closing brace here, right? So that ends that statement, like from the, from the parameter in the last piece. And then it just says, drop table students. So, and they're like, oh yes, little Bobby, Bobby tables we call him. Uh, this is a real thing that happens. So people will just cause chaos by going through and forcing, forcing companies to lose their data by doing these things, just dropping all the tables, dropping tables, just completely deleting them. They usually can't be recovered very easily unless they have backups. And because databases are really transactional, 
and often have changes occurring you know, in the moment, <laughs> backups occur periodically, it can be really, really painful for an organization or in some cases, like incredibly dangerous. So can I, I, when I lived over in Germany, they had this happen and it was people would actually would put pieces of um, code, essentially like null values and null overwrites as stickers on the back of their car. So when the cameras that would catch them speeding that use object character recognition would read for characters looking that. for a license plate, it would most of the time catch a null value and write that there was no license plate. That's amazing. It, yeah. It would essentially the same, less, less dangerous, but essentially the same thing and kind of genius if you take the risk. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and it would be really hard for, you know, a police officer to pull you over and justify that. Well, like, why can't I, have this word on my car. Like it's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so that one's a really common one. I'll say it's so common that, that most developers do know about it. Uh, does it still happen? Yeah, I've seen it happen. Um, but there's usually a lot of tooling in place and very frequently I, tools are, have kind of caught up more, but it's still, you know, near the, it's on the top 10 list for things that are occurring more frequently than not. So, uh, it's just a good thing to be aware of. And so when you're in the way you can approach this, if you're not a software engineer is like I said, the, the way to start the conversation is, do you know what these things are? <laughs> right. If your team doesn't, it's a quick conversation. It's just direct them to the OWASP page. Uh, you can show them this PowerPoint. It's a quick read and then go through and just kind of get that idea. And like it on the OWASP page, not only does it have the vulnerabilities as code examples and it has remediation strategies, right? So that's, you have all of that there, so you can address it and you kind of go in through and fix it. So it's a great just jumping off point. OWASP is an amazing tool. If you're just trying to, if you need a quick win on security. Uh, the next piece is broken authentication. And this is when applications function related uh, to the authentication and session management. Uh, they're not implemented correctly. So basically, um, this is any kind of issue with identifying uh, users' passwords, like not having things be revoked. I, or having authentication passed out. So, so credential stuffing is one of those things. So let's say you implement a password authentication system uh, and you don't have any kind of timeout on it. What you can do is there's a link here to a list of known passwords on GitHub. Let me pull that up. Sorry, one second, I'm just gonna get that over to the other monitor. And this just literally has a list of all of the most common passwords. This is, a, this is a tool you can use to make sure that your application is secure or to make sure, or to tell your users maybe not to use a password. You could implement one of these lists and say, you know, I don't really wanna click on this. <laughs> it probably could take forever to load up, but Maybe let's go with this top 100. That's probably not my computer. But I, you can have your application be architected in such a way that they look for these things. So you could do periodic checks in your database. Yeah, if you just saw your password pop up there, you should probably change it. Um, but you can, you can implement your tools in such a way that they just try these different things. So you, could, you could actually use this to do, do an, a user audit uh, if you're in an organization just periodically, you could have this be an automated process that make sure your developers aren't typing these things into things for production. So there's giant lists out here and there's the other pe the other problem with those is not only are these passwords known and you can throw these big lists at them, the encryption for them has been solved. Like people will just simply go and encrypt these various strings and then they know what it looks like. So encryption is just like, a, it's just a cipher being applied to something that cipher is just as recognizable if you know what it is, right? There's these giant, they're called hash tables that have just the various encrypted values for all of these really common passwords and they're really easy to look up, really easy to break. Um, so another scenario besides the, you know, just bad password situation is a lot of them, a lot of attacks occur just because people don't change their passwords very often. And sometimes this is because organizations are really strict about uh, the things they're hoping people will put into the passwords. They'll want an uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, a, a pound sign. 
you know, if your password is P and then, you know, a four and then two fives, a W, a zero, an R and a D, you know, it, I, it doesn't matter if that's uppercase or lowercase, every single version of that is available and has been encrypted and is being used by somebody, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. And if you just jokingly made that as something that you thought your whole team would be able to use and remember, it's not very secure. Some of these things have absolutely no impact on what makes something an actual weak password. They're, the idea was to get them off of things that are found in that list, but these lists are, they're millions of things long now, they're billions in some cases. That doesn't work anymore. Uh, another thing is sometimes application sessions, uh, we'll, we'll talk about like how to set some good passwords and maybe a funny example in a second. Um, but one of the best things to use is just long phrases. Right? Something you can remember that's unique, right? A sentence is usually a good one. Uh, one that you'll remember, but is maybe something that wouldn't normally come up. But uh, application session time, timeouts aren't set properly. And that's where uh, you're using a public computer. Um, you know, you log into your Facebook. Your Facebook has your payment information attached to it. Somebody just pops it up, wires themselves a bunch of money using, you know, the Facebook cash app, you know, using a fake account. Not much you can do about it. Um, so public computer, you know, that, that would be something where security team on those public computers hadn't implemented those things. A little less we could do on the development side, um, but it's something you could, you, you could think about. You'd maybe, if you're developing a tool like this, you could look for maybe a regular patterns of usage. Um, again, this is that GitHub page. So Seclist is another group similar to OWASP who tries to solve this problem. Uh, they're trying to just provide tools for security testers so you can ask you know, if, you, if you're on a project that's implementing this type of authentication, almost all have it at some point. You can just say, hey, are you aware of you know, tools like Seclist or OWASP that have looked for ways to break this down? Uh, and that just, it's just something to incur, you know, maybe just a way to jump off, to start that conversation, do some research, see if some of these things could be implemented, or maybe even just start an audit. Uh, and here's the relevant XKCD for this one. The uh, best comic ever yeah. by them, by the way. Uh, yeah, is this your password? No, I, but at one point it was a reference to it, but no, not exactly. Yeah. I would bet that this is also, you know, in, in a bunch of rainbow tables right now being used by security professionals. But uh, this hits the nail on the head. So, you know, they're asking for some kind of gibberish word and they're talking about passwords and entropy, right? So entropy is basically how hard is it to guess something by a brute force attack? Like how difficult is it to actually solve? And so it's a measure of complexity of a string, basically. And you know, they're going through and this person's trying to remember it. Um, so it's difficult to, difficulty to guess is pretty easy for this because it's, it's compliant with all these rules. But it has a pretty low level of entropy. Um, so it could take just three days to break it. Uh, if somebody just like grabbed your home computer and your hard drive and was just sitting there just brute force trying to get, solve it, they'll get it in three days. And you're gonna have a really hard time remembering what you typed in for this. Um, <laughs> and this is, you know, correct horse battery staple has four, 44 bits of entropy, so it would take 550 years to guess. So probably not worth it for most people. I mean, you, could, you can make that, you, could, you can obviously scale that up if you've got a supercomputer. You might not stop the NSA with this, but um, <laughs> it's, all, it's also pretty easy to remember uh, because it's ridiculous. <laughs> like, and so this is a very common meme, uh, as, as you pointed out. Um, for something you can use to make your passwords. But I, I do think long, long phrases are the best, in my opinion. That's what I almost always use for development passwords. I like to set up the, the course for that early. Like, so I, have re I will reject oftentimes even development applications when we just use password one, two, three. I know it doesn't matter, but it's just better to just kind of get it out there early. So, because people will say, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know the right practice. If you start it early, it just makes it fun. And also it's really just fun to come up with really weird long sentences and pass them around anyway. Uh, next one, obviously, is sensitive data exposure. So I, I don't know what your familiar, you know, what everyone's level of familiarity with deploying APIs look like, but oftentimes, um, you know, there will be different scenarios where there's publicly facing accessible information. So the back end of an application uh, shouldn't really be able to be hit by a public facing entity. You shouldn't be able to just type in the address of an API in your web browser if it has sensitive information. And with, you know, 
retrieve information from it. That information should be in a private subnet, should be somewhere locked off in a network where it's secure. That's not often the case, and this happens quite a lot. Um, we see this happening quite a bit with you know, S3 bucket exposure. I'm sure everyone's, or most of you may have heard about uh, examples of there just being publicly exposed S3 buckets. S3 buckets are just a way to store files, sometimes static web pages, uh, on, through Amazon Web Services. And a lot of times what happens is there's a big toggle uh, on, on Amazon Web Services that's where you can make everything, all the buckets private. And I've tried to solve the problem by doing that. Uh, but the problem is once you deploy one public uh, bucket in your account so a developer can do it, that toggles off. But a common misconception people will have is that because they toggled that thing once, they assume it enforces the rule going forward, there will be no more uh, publicly facing S3 buckets. But you know, people that aren't used to, to storing information this way will go and they'll up, accidentally upload files that might have sensitive you know, user information that they might have uh, patient health information or personal identifiable information. And there, is ju there are just massive servers. Uh, there, there are you know, state level entities that are scanning for these things. There are all kinds of different users that are just basically looking to get this information and they, they're really good at finding it almost immediately. I've seen this exact, this exact attack happen uh, at several really large corporations um, where basically somebody will check in a password to like that allow or an API key, something that allows them to like programmatically interact with something like AWS or, or another cloud provider. Uh, they'll accidentally check it into their source control. And once it's in there, it's scooped up so quickly there because there's these scanners that are kind of looking for these things on there and they kind of recognize the patterns, especially with a, uh, most common API keys like Twitter or Amazon web services. The first four characters are always the same. So it's pretty obvious. You can just have a scanner that's constantly reading GitHub looking for like AKIA. And that's the beginning of like the way to authenticate in Amazon. <laughs> and then immediately the account will be, you know, will launch a script in the account and start mining for whatever cryptocurrency is popular for that. And there is, of course, a relevant XKD for this one, um, <laughs> which is, so they're just talking about uh, here. It's like, so server, are you still there? If so, reply potato. Um, it's like, okay, I want these six letters potato. Turns back potato. It says server, are you still there? If so, reply bird. Uh, and it's saying user Meg wants these four letters bird. And it's saying, okay, he responds back with that. It's, it says, server, are you still there? If so, reply hat. And it replies back hat. And then finally, it just says, I basically tells the server that uh, Meg wants these 500 letters. Oh, wait, it, it's passing in the response 500 letters. So it comes back with hat and then the next 500 things in the log. And then the information in that log afterwards may very well contain an admin user, their password, the authentication key that was used. Uh, all kinds of stuff could pop out in a system log. Um, an actual pretty common security flaw would be Jenkins, which is a common CI CD tool. When it first starts up, it outputs its master user password into the log. And sometimes that's not changed immediately. Sometimes people are just using that for test purposes. And sometimes those test instances have access to <laughs> they kind of have the keys to the castle uh, for all the development artifacts. They might not be able to get production data, but they could very well set your company back with tons of you know, uh, intellectual property. Uh, the next one is XML uh, eternal, external entities. I'm, I'm not as familiar with this one. Um, many, you know, it says saying many older or poorly configured XML processors evaluate external entity references within XML documents. So XML looks like this. It's basically just, a, it's kind of similar to HTML, just a way to, it's a markup language. It's a way to just pass documents around on the web, kind of the same HTML's hypertext markup language. I think XML is, uh, I actually forget what it stands for, like extra markup language, something. There's a lot of different types of markup languages, but basically what can happen is you can pass in a type of an, an entity into this that just references something else. So inside this, uh, inside of this XML itself 
it starts referencing a system file. And the file that it's referencing here, Etsy password is actually a list of all the users and their level of privilege. So then you can focus in your attack a bit more on like, okay, I know these users have access to the entire system. Let's try to compromise these users, right? Well, it won't actually give you their passwords, but it will get you closer on at least let you target your attack. Uh, and the next is like, you can just have, you can just start trying to inject like internal IP addresses. So things you can try to look for things inside an internal directory and just hope you get a response back and it'll just output. So you might accidentally get some kind of internal server and, you, and who knows what could be in there that it has access to just, just basically looking for any type of web server, any kind of endpoint that's available um, in the internal network. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, there's XML out there and it's again, not sterilized. This is pretty similar to the SQL injection attack. It's just a different vector for it. Uh, this is broken access control. And this is uh, kind of similar to the password authentication and at least in the way I conceptualize it. So this is saying, you know, you've got restrictions on what authentication users are allowed to do and they're not properly enforced. I see this happening quite a bit when, with setting up user access control. Uh, for me, my biggest example is usually in Amazon Web Services. Uh, a lot of tools and software let you basically create policy documents that allow users to access resources to do their jobs. A lot of times you need this for developers. The problem is those policy documents are basically just code. I mean, they have all the same principles. They can be pretty obtuse. They hit certain uh, API features and flags. And so they really kind of need to be tested and developed. Like you need people to test, like does this allow you to do X, does this allow you to do Y? But the first thing that happens when something's blocking people from work is they just like, we're like throw the whole thing wide open and we'll come back and get it later. The problem is it doesn't, you know, sometimes that just goes into, into the back of technical debt and it never happens later. And because these things don't change, all of a sudden one, you know, one user given too much access privilege is able to, get more information than they should. And this, and this isn't always just users. It could be an application that you're deploying. You could deploy, you know, something really benign uh, into your, you know, out into your process and somebody gets a hold of something really simple, like a, let's say like a weather app that's being hosted on your application, but that weather app is running with, you know, super user privileges on your servers and it becomes compromised by someone or someone pretends to be the weather app. And then all of a sudden it's able to just kind of run loose in your system and, and have all kinds of security flaws. Um, this is kind of similar to security misconfiguration. Again, they're kind of, kind of flows together here. This is, uh, so this is actually more about the S3 buckets um, and things like that. But in my mind, the, the, the difference here is there's a little bit of overlap, but the biggest difference here is I've told my application it needs these dependencies and rather than absorbing, you know, rather than vetting those dependencies or this configuration, uh, those, those pieces themselves have security flaws. So I, uh, you could have a series of packages that this happens all the time that, you know, have, have known issues with them. Like they're, they're no longer, they're implementing one of the other security flaws. They don't have, you know, password authentication or they're susceptible to, to uh, SQL injection and your application could be completely and utterly, uh, you know, compromises results of it, or you could have, you know, servers that are misconfigured to allow traffic from sources they shouldn't. And as a result of it, I, uh, you know, people are able to access again, information that they shouldn't the, This is one of the ones that's really easy to automate the detection of. Um, but again, you know, using the S3 public buck bucket example, this is something that has cost all of these, companies, you know, billions of dollars, probably at this point, if you just sum it all up, uh, Capital One just recently had had an attack on this. It was really embarrassing. Much of their public, uh, yeah, much of their information on credit accounts had been made public. But a lot of these times when you get emails saying that your information has been compromised in a security breach, it has been due to this exact issue uh, in the past. And this is, this is just a really short list of some of the companies that this has affected. Um, there've been some really embarrassing ones. There've been some embarrassing ones in the, in the defense sector as well. So the fine companies are very, very um, suspicious of configurations and S3 buckets in place. And this is one of the areas where I think for the most part, I've seen large amounts of advancement because companies are really willing to invest the time 
and money to implement tools to, to scan for these things in their deployment pipelines. Uh, the next one is cross-site scripting. So this, this occurs whenever an application includes untrusted data in a new web page without proper, proper validation or, or escaping. Uh, sounds kind of similar to SQL injection again. There's, there's some kind of similar themes here. Um, so it, it updates an existing web page or, or user supply data using a browser API and that can create other things. So th this is kind of like injecting a, it's, it's a way that a website can basically, you can trick, um, you can trick a website into running things or trick a user into running things on another website uh, or running a script that it shouldn't uh, by just taking advantage of the fact that certain pieces of it haven't been designed properly. So you could deploy a web page. The HTML itself, again, isn't really looking for, um, you know, it's not really looking for ways to sterilize uh, the type of input it's getting, like for credit card number here. And what happens is uh, uh, an attacker will go in and put something kind of similar to the SQL injection. They'll just put a string in here that looks like HTML, but it tells the HTML to run a script that basically has some kind of tracking mechanism or a cookie that then will then run after it. So now the website is running this, this cookie CGI script and everyone afterwards that enters their credit card information is having that reported back to the user. So it's kind of like a man in the middle attack. Uh, this is why it's really important to make sure there's, there's not only sterilization of, of the input for your databases, but also sterilization of the input um, for your HTML as well that can make sure you're using tools that will only really execute things that are expected to be run or, or scripts that are, are stored uh, internally by your application. So this is why it's important to usually host your JavaScript yourself and have that maybe have permission set. So only, you know, locally running or, you know, things hosted or de deployed by your company are able to be run by your website. Because if not, and you make this kind of mistake, all of a sudden an external piece of JavaScript can be running or some other type of script that's all of a sudden compromising your users and actually is just running on your servers. Uh, so this is insecure deserialization, another thing that can lead to remote code execution. Uh, so even if they do not re result in that, they can often lead to uh, replay attacks and injection attacks and privilege escalation. So deserialization is basically the idea of taking something like XML or HTML or JSON or one of those other types of documents that are really popular in passing around uh, machine language and turning that into memory for the computer. So putting, putting those in there. And when that happens, if you don't sterilize your input, so again, similar to the SQL query attack, similar to a lot of the other ones we've talked about, if when you're doing that, there's no security in place, if it's just blindly trusting anything it sees, it can deserialize and pretend to be a block of code that will then execute when your program runs. So uh, in this example, you know, you might have a file that has the username and password that you don't check in anywhere, um, that you normally, you know, just have set properly for your, you know, in your, for, for authentication, you just pass it around through some secure means to your team. Uh, it gets serialized, the password uh, accidentally comes in and when it's written into memory is written in incorrectly or it has some kind of, uh, or isn't able to accept some kind of character. Like let's say for example, uh, somebody put in a foreign language character it wasn't expecting and it reads in that password and the, the system itself believes the password to be null or to not have a value. Then when it's deserialized and it's spit back out to another file, uh, it winds up basically just allowing anyone to pipe in any password as long as they have the admin user. Um, so there's some, here's a scenario, a, like a PHP forum uses a PHP object serialization to save a, a cookie containing the user's user ID, password, hash, and other state. So, you know, the website will save all these things in so the user doesn't have to keep typing in this information. And all the attacker, what, the way they've done the, uh, the user piece is they're just transferring it. It's not an encrypted value. It's just little list as user. So the attacker can just go in, change, like use their own key, 
and change this group value. So this user here is meant to be a group uh, in this example and just change it to admin and all of a sudden they're authenticated as that because the system when it's reading it into memory just trusts whatever the cookie is giving it. Uh, another one is using common components with, uh, with vulnerabilities. So this is again similar to using dependencies or any kind of frameworks or a piece of software uh, that allow for servers or, or data loss to be taken over. This happens a lot. Um, the big difference here well, that distinguishes it from purely just a configuration issue because it seems like a bit of a semantic piece. Um, but a specific thing here is there or is, is Internet of Things devices, right? So Internet of Things devices often are given pretty high levels of access to, to networks because they need them. Maybe they were just not implemented correctly or it's a, it's a pretty new field. So security isn't as locked down as it is in some other areas. Uh, and so as a result of this, you know, you can have things that are instantly able to uh, access like the entire network. So this is, this is really a problem for a lot of power plants. Uh, places like Disney World are concerned about things like this where they have these big long pieces of connection and they assume that they can't all talk to each other because some of them might not even have internet access. Um, but they'll introduce new pieces, new Internet of Things technology. They'll, you know, they'll install an Alexa server and these people are using Alexa and they're never updating it. They're telling Alexa it can't update. And all of a sudden somebody gains access to that because some known vulnerabilities published and they're able to use some other exploit to access the rest of the network. Some, there's some exploits that don't even need uh, the Internet to, to access them. They're, they're called air gap attacks. You know, sometimes there's been some really weird ones. Um, like sometimes it's just certain noises can trigger things that will be interpreted by microphones and other pieces of software and that can be that will just make you know some unexpected event happen or lead to some kind of other attacker vector um, another piece is you know Internet of Things devices you, know, you could have a, a situation where you know pacemakers or something uh, have some sort of mechanism like Bluetooth or something to be updated but they haven't been updated in a while uh, this is a pretty extreme and kind of gory example, but some one that like I've seen ethics papers written on uh, when I was in grad school, you know, and potentially somebody could come by and exploit some kind of vulnerability or some kind of encryption vulnerability and do something to you know misregulate that pacemaker. Uh, the next one is insufficient logging and monitoring. Uh, there's this could go kind of a few different ways. It's pretty obvious what it is on the surface, and this is the last one we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so, a lot of times you'll see there's open source projects. So one of the reasons people are secure to, uh, concerned about them, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a very justified concern because usually open source projects kind of are so community focused that they address these problems really easily, and problems are addressed pretty rapidly. Um, but one of the things that could happen is, you know, you could accidentally give somebody uh, access to a repository and not be monitoring or tracking their movement. And they could just start deleting things, removing pieces of code. Um, and if you don't have any alerts set out, like if the rest of the team isn't being emailed every time code changes happen, they can just keep doing that and then remove everybody else from the access list. And you basically just, just have no notification of it. So, you know, I think it's kind of obvious why insufficiently tracking things would, would cause problems. Um, but it is another large security issue that has caused, uh, you know, some big problems in the past. And so that ends the, the purely me talking at all of you section for, for security for tonight. Does anyone have any questions on any of the material we've covered so far, any of these security issues or how to triage them? So, well, I guess in summary, you know, the big thing when dealing with all these, I don't expect all of you to, you know, memorize any of this material. Uh, I just wanted to talk to it because it isn't covered in the book. It does talk about shifting left on security, but this is why we need to do that. This is why it's important. And these are some of the really common scenarios that you will run into, that things that, that will pop up on, on, these, on these projects. Um, like I said, a great place to start is going through looking at that OWASP list. They have a checklist there. If you don't, if you don't have one for your company, they do have a checklist you can go through and download. Uh, 
and it, it like the link is in the beginning of the PowerPoint presentation and you can just ask questions like are we implementing this are we implementing that or are we not and then it also does have the additional remediation strategy where you know if you do have this vulnerability these are some of the things you can implement and as recommendations for tools or just some different processes or idioms you can use to kind of mitigate these types of problems um, but in my opinion you know shifting left on security involves two big things and one of them is you know automating the tests where possible you know having some kind of suite of security tools that goes and checks for these things you know that tests tries to put in wrong passwords tries to um exploit all the different vectors for executing code in ways you shouldn't like using xml or cross-site scripting uh and a lot of times those are just tools you buy off the shelf um that are kind of have a lot of these use cases but another piece is just making sure that everyone on the development team is aware of some of these everyone from product designers project managers to at least know the basics of these you know that this is the basic formula of when we're designing things or implementing things this is what to look for this because they, they do follow a really similar pattern which is misconfiguration and uh not following what is known as a zero trust model which is nothing should trust any other system except for things that explicitly is given access to you know, shouldn't expect any input other than the exact things it's looking for. All right, well, does, does anyone have any additional questions or any questions about anything else we've covered? I know I covered that kind of fast, but I'm happy to give you, you know, 45 minutes back, or I'm happy to answer your questions on any of the material we've covered so far, or anything outside of, you know, this. I don't, I don't have any specific questions for you to answer. I am asking, like I said, anyone who hasn't attended to, to complete a discussion prompt just to kind of like get the same amount of time added for the course. But that's that's about it. Um, I could, I, one thing I would, I would throw in there just for the sake of having input is, um, a lot of people in here aren't developers. So, you know, this probably seems like a whole lot, but it almost doesn't matter because depending on your industry, when auditors come in, they don't usually talk directly to the developers. You're going to get the questions. Very true. And so I happen to have a background in development. So when I get these questions, I know how to answer them. And then I get calls from people in other um, areas of IT that don't have this sort of background. So, there is some reason to have your, to have some idea of this, this sort of thing, because the questions will come to management regardless. I know it's not logical, but that's where it hits. They don't want to talk to the developers usually. Yeah, many, there are like, and OWASP again has a list of security compliance reasons, but similar to, the way most projects will need to consider and ask questions about have we dealt with things like accessibility? Like, is this available for people that are red, you know, red, green, colorblind? Is this available for people that have other sensory issues? You know, this is something that will come up. There will be oftentimes questions about this, especially if you're working with anything in the public sector, they have fairly specific requirements. There's like a series of security compliance you need to know and speak to. Again, I don't expect anybody here to be able to go in and solve uh, a SQL injection problem. Like I, that's not something I'm, I'm expecting, but I did think this information would be helpful to have and know about and know a bit more about how to, how to get involved in that conversation or where to start. Because I'm seeing organizations across the board, they've moved DevOps, they haven't implemented DevOps, they haven't, which is again, continuous delivery and those capabilities that were listed in, in the Accelerate book that try to get those outcomes spoken about in the Phoenix project in the DevOps handbook. Uh, they haven't quite got there yet, but they've already kind of jumped the gun and they're now looking for DevSecOps, but they don't really, they don't really understand the problem space yet. And what they, a lot of times at the, the people don't know where to start. They're like, do we need to hire somebody new? Do we hire a DevSecOps coach? Do we hire DevSecOps engineers? A lot of them, some of them have just made, we're made, we've made everybody DevSecOps, which is, has made traditional ops people super confused because now they're being asked to do three different jobs and they don't understand. They barely understood why they were a dev and an ops. Now they've got DevSecOps and they kind of are just throwing their hat up um, about it. But 
in reality, there are different responsibilities that can be had here. As project managers, I think facilitating these times of conversation, asking these questions of your teams, have you thought about this? It's a quick, it's a quick conversation. It can be something that can be dealt with in a sprint. Like, answer this. Have we have, go through this checklist from OWASP? Are you aware of these security vulnerabilities? Have we done, are we aware of these top 10? Are we, or even, are we susceptible to any of these? You know, that could be a first pass. That's an easy way to have a quick win. This is oftentimes what, we, what we'll do just to kind of start the conversation off on our own internal teams. And then from there, uh, maybe have some people that have extra interest, and then you get your technical lead, you might get a, an architect to go in and find some tools, find some recommendations, maybe some specific implementations from OWASP or, or other places like, that can help mitigate these things. And then do another checklist. Do you have these? Have you used these? Are these on use of your clients? Um, if you're in, the, in the, the government space, it's super important to know about these because any technical project you're on will involve high levels of conversation about these. They're, like, there's, there's these technical standards and security standards, these NISTs they're called. And oftentimes developers will need to or, or, or strongly have preferences about tools. And in order to move the ball forward and get approval for those tools, they have to understand these vulnerabilities and how they're able to get those through. And the more you're able to facilitate that conversation and hopefully participate it without completely glossing over, it's okay if you glossed over during this, we went really fast, but like at least being able to kind of have this in the back of your mind, like, oh, I see why that's important, or I see why you're looking to implement this tool, or I see why maybe that's not important, why I don't know why the security team's on that, and being able to have the developers, you know, have their backs when they're having that conversation is really important. Josh, I have a few questions. One, you are going to post this, right? So we can actually kind of surf around on some of the websites and links that are included. Yeah, the PowerPoint okay. slide is already up. And after this, as soon as it's done processing, I'll put oh, this it is. in the lecture slides. Okay. And then on the like OWASP, like this top 10 list, are those in a priority order? Or is there anywhere good to kind of find like trend lines? Like, is there a way to distinguish like whichever you know, kind of technology generation we're in or moving into, like, are some of these much more common or things that you should look out for much more than the others, depending on the way that your particular system is set up or technology being used or? Yeah, so every year OWASP puts out a report and just, they do, they, they, it's basically a frequency map. Where's, where's the exact report? Let me pull it up. Yeah, the OWASP top 10. So these, this basically is a prioritized list. Um, uh, you know, that, that was the one for, from 2020, but they go through and they've got trends. Here's the data for it. So. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's great. That's all in there, the prioritization and then the trend lines. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and that's not part of, um, you know, there is a whole paid component and obviously subscribing to them can be really helpful uh, and just getting this information. I'm pretty sure just the, getting the newsletters and data piece is probably pretty cheap, but they, they make all of the really important pieces available for free. Like the, at least the, let's start the conversation. Let's do those checklists. That's all usually available for free or is available for free. I know. Cause we, we use that. Uh, does anyone have any other questions?